Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for being here. My name is Yixian Li, and I'm on the National Climate Assessment Team here at the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. Before we start, I want to draw your attention to the note chat box. Audio is disabled for all participants, but if you have questions or comments throughout today's session, please enter them in the chat. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Aaron Grade, who is our technical support person today. Please also note that all participants are expected to be respectful and considerate toward others per USGCRP code of conduct. Next slide, please. I'll kick off our webinar today with some background information about the National Climate Assessment before turning it over to the water chapter authors. Next slide. The U.S. Global Change Research Program was mandated by Congress in the Global Change Research Act of 1990 to, quote, assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change, end quote. The program convenes 14 agencies to advance climate and global change science and to provide useful and usable information to decision makers. Next slide, please. The law that established the program also mandates a periodic scientific assessment known as the National Climate Assessment or the NCA. The NCA is a quadrennial report that analyzes the effects of global change on several sectors, the natural environment, agriculture, energy, land and water resources, transportation, human health, social systems, and biodiversity. USGCRP is charged with assessing current trends as well as projections for the next 25 to 100 years. The NCA is used by organizations and individuals for a variety of purposes, including national policy making, risk assessment in the private sector, local mitigation and adaptation planning, as well as by practitioners, utility managers, and formal and informal educators. Next slide, please. NCA authors review a large body of scientific research from diverse information sources. They synthesize th that information, examine the confidence in our scientific understanding, and evaluate uncertainties. NCA 5 was written by 500 authors and 260 technical contributors from every state in the nation, as well as Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and Palau. The NCA is designed to be policy relevant. Authors distill their findings into accessible language framed around risks to people and important resources. That said, the report is strictly not policy prescriptive and does not advocate for particular viewpoints or policy measures. The NCA uses a range of future projections to help decision makers understand the full extent of possible risks that can be avoided or reduced under different scenarios and leaves it up to the decision maker to ultimately determine their risk threshold. The assessment complies with all applicable federal laws and policies, including the Global Change Research Act and other laws that govern information quality, accessibility, and transparency. Finally, the report process involves extensive review, including several opportunities for public engagement, a review by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, or NACIEN, and other government science reviews. Next, please. Now, let's take a look at NCA5 table of contents. Like previous NCAs, NCA5 covers national level topics, regions, and response actions. The report opens with an overview, which is followed by two chapters dedicated to the physical science of poly, uh, physical science of climate change. Then there are national topic chapters, the 10 regional chapters, and two response chapters. Although response act expense actions are also discussed throughout the report in the other chapters. The NCA table of contents has evolved over time informed by user input. NCA5 added two new chapters one on economics, and one on social systems and justice. We also have five new focus features, compound extreme events, 
Western wildfires, COVID-19, supply chains, and blue carbon. We also have several appendices, including a new one dedicated to indicators. Now, now that we have gone through some introductory background, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Elizabeth Payton, the chapter lead of the water chapter, and five other talented water chapter authors, Justin, Steph, Debbie, Dan, and Heather. They will now lead us through the remainder of the webinar today. Thank you all so much. Take it away, please, Liz. Thanks, Yixian. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar. I'm Liz Payton, a water resources specialist with Western Water Assessment, a NOAA CAP RISA program hosted by Ceres at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Before we get into the contents of the chapter, I'd like to acknowledge the art that has been included in the National Climate Assessment this time. This painting of Lake Mead by John Bradham is the cover image of our chapter and is called Droughts Edge Illuminated. You can read the artist's statement in the Art by Climate tab, and we appreciate this piece and the other art pieces that have been added to our chapter. I'm going to get us started and then hand it off to members of the author team. We began the chapter writing process by identifying as a team the questions we wanted to tackle in the chapter. The questions we identified were, how are changes in climate influencing water input volume and movement? How are extremes and the notion of extremes changing? How are changes in climate stressing both natural and human-made systems? What are the environmental justice considerations and the distribution of impacts? And are current climate data and tools adequate for decision makers? These questions guided the scope, findings, and organization of our chapter into three key messages. Our first key message is about changes to the water cycle. Our second key message is about the impacts to human and ecological systems from the changes described in the previous key message. And our third key message is about adaptation, some of the tools, support, and successes, as well as some of the barriers and difficulties. We will dig into these three key messages in the presentation. And you can find the full text of each key message in the chapter. Our experts' contributions spanned these key messages. So to minimize handoffs during the presentation, we've organized the presentation by expert topic rather than by key message. We'll start with Justin Fluke to explain our water cycle projection maps and to talk about the future of snow. All right. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you, Liz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Justin Flug. I'm an assistant research scientist uh, with the University of Maryland. And today I'm going to be talking a bit about our coverage of snow in the water chapter. But before diving into that, I really wanted to touch on these figures of climate and hydrologic projections because you'll be seeing several of them today, and they're included in our chapter in several places as well. Um, so these projections come from the Fifth Cli Climate Model Intercomparison Project, or CMIP-5. We focus most heavily on RCP 4.5, which is a scenario of long-term global emissions that is considered moderate, with the emissions peaking around 2040. Uh, these were provided to a land surface model and used to generate uh, hydrologic projections of water on our land surface, such as snow, uh, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and runoff. Um, so most of these plots show hydrologic projections from a 30-year middle of the century period, from 2036 to 2065, um, and compare those relative to a 30-year historical period from 91 to 2020. Um, we have a whole set of climate projections, and so here uh, for these plots on the left, we show the average and also include the highest and lowest 20% of these projections uh, for each variable. Um, so diving into this plot in particular, most of the U.S. we actually see is expected to see increases in annual precipitation, um, but these decreases are most heavily focused in the U.S. Southwest. Um, however, there are some spread in these projections. You can see for the wettest and driest 20% projection showing pretty national scale increases and decreases respectively. That being said, um, there are regions that show higher uh, agreement and in future precipitation increases. This includes uh, the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast, and regions like the Florida Panhandle. Um, next slide, please. 
All right, so despite increases in precipitation, these studies uh, largely agree that future climates will have decreases to snow. And specifically, if you think about this with future uh, increases in temperature, we expect to see increased fractions of precipitation falling as rainfall instead of snowfall, earlier spring snowmelt onset dates, and actually altered rates of snowmelt during the spring. And we actually see this in our historical records as well. So this uh, plot shows the Western US where actual a majority of our annual water currently comes from snowmelt each year. Dots show trends at snow observation stations with red and blue colors showing decreases and decreasing and increasing trends respectively. Um, and the size of the dot actually indicates the magnitude of the trend. Uh, starting with plot B, we see pretty widespread advancements to the timing of maximum snowpack, uh, with snow peaking about eight days earlier on average. Uh, this advancement and changes to the snow melt and snow sublimation have also decreased the length of the snow season by about 18 days on average relative to the 1980s that's shown there in plot c um, and this uh, uh, and if we focus here on april 1st this is kind of a date used to approximate peak snow volume in the west about 93 percent of our sites see decreases to snow since the 1950s averaging approximately 23 percent decrease um, next slide please um, and our climate projections also indicate that the trend shown in the previous slide will continue out to the mid-century and even later. Um, this plot shows projected changes to mid-century maximum snow water equivalent, or SWE, which is a measure of the water that's stored in the snowpack. And outside of the Alaskan interior, we actually see maximum snow water equivalent is projected to de decrease across a uh, massive portion of the, Western, or of the United States as a whole. Um, the largest expected decreases are in these western coastal and maritime mountain ranges where we uh, snow often exists. Uh, larger volumes of snow often exist, but we also see warmer conditions than snow, say in the interior climate, such as in Colorado and in Wyoming. And again, despite the increase in spread and uh, precipitation shown earlier, uh, snow is largely expected to decrease for both the extreme wettest and driest projections shown there on the right plot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know that snow is actually a really great indicator of climate because it has size, high sensitivity to both temperature and precipitation. Um, so in our chapter, we actually included a breakout box that was focused on snow droughts and their impacts on stream flow. And here we focused on two scenarios. We focused uh, on one scenario in Washington state and one in California, and we compared uh, average uh, annual stream flow uh, for all years between 1952 and 2020, and also looked at water year 2015, which is a very abnormal year in the Western United States. And specifically, we compared Washington because this was a region that had typically average precipitation, near average precipitation, but it fell, uh, the winter time temperatures were significantly warmer, and much of that precipitation fell as rainfall instead of snowfall. And this was opposed to California, which actually had a much uh, reduced uh, input of precipitation that year. And in both cases, uh, annual um, snowpack was reduced significantly and decreased the spring stream flow in both of these locations, putting a significant stress on downstream water users, specifically in the agricultural sector. And this is a figure uh, from our chapter that shows an apple orchard in the Rosa Irrigation District that was really, really drought stressed in uh, September 2015 largely due from that shift of uh, precipitation falling as snowfall into rainfall and reduced spring stream flow. Um, so for here, I will uh, wrap up and I'll hand off now to Dr. Stephanie McAfee, who will talk more about drought. Um, I'll also touch on soil moisture and evapotranspiration. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much, Justin. I'm Steph McAfee, the Regional Administrator for the USGS Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. So I thought by I'd talking start by talking about drought more broadly, and it's defined as a period of drier than normal conditions. And we know that higher temperatures can contribute to drought by increasing evapotranspiration. And so this is the water loss to the atmosphere by evaporation or through plant transpiration. And one common way of looking at drought is the standardized precipitation minus evapotranspiration index shown here. It tracks both precipitation and that atmospheric demand for moisture. Over the 20th and early 21st century, some places have tended towards more drought in the brown and tan colors and some towards less, those are the greener colors. And broadly speaking, parts of the country that have been getting more 
precipitation, like much of the East, have experienced less drought on average, but a long-term increase in drought is apparent in parts of the West and especially in the Southwest. But one thing to point out here is that even regions where long-term trends show a tendency towards less drought can still experience drought. Next slide, please, Liz. Now, another way of looking at changes in moisture availability is through the climatic water deficit. And this is looking at how much water is actually available relative to plant water need and atmospheric demand. Um, and here you see that arrangement of maps similar to what Justin was showing with the average of all mid-century projections on the left and the wettest and driest 20% on the right. Now, CMIT-5 projections indicate generally drier conditions in the future in most places. And this is because plant water needs and atmospheric demand increase as temperature rises. So we can see increasing water deficits in the brown, even in places where precipitation might increase in the future, right? And that would be is if evapotranspiration increases more than uh, precipitation, okay? And even under some of the wettest projections here, uh, much of the West and parts of the Northeast could be drier than they are today in terms of moisture availability. Now over the Southeast, the plains and parts of Texas, um, there's a real spread between the wettest and driest uh, projections with the possibility for wetter conditions if wetter projections come to pass and much drier conditions if drier conditions actually occur by mid-century. Next slide, please, Liz. And finally, we're looking at changes in actual evapotranspiration. And this is the amount of water that is actually evaporated or transpired by plants. And it increases when atmospheric demand for moisture grows, which often happens as temperatures rise, but only if there's enough water available to evaporate in the soil or in bodies of water. And in places like much of the East, where climate projections suggest warmer conditions with more precipitation, we see this actual evapotranspiration increase in those green colors. In places where temperatures are projected to increase, but precipitation decreases or doesn't change very much, the actual evapotranspiration decreases shown in those brown colors because there's simply not enough water to meet that uh, evaporative demand. And again, we see that very wide spread in projections in parts of the country with the wettest projections um, leaning towards more evap evapotranspiration and the driest leaning towards less. Next slide, please, Liz. Okay, now most of these maps have shown annual conditions, but summer soil moisture is especially important for agriculture and for many ecosystems as well. And so here we're seeing projected changes in the average summer soil moisture by the middle of this century. And under both the, so, sorry, um, under both the driest 20% of projections and the average, soils are expected to be drier in the summer across much of the US. Um, though we are expecting wetter soils in a few places in the upper Midwest and in parts of Alaska. Now, and among even the wettest 20% of projections, summer soil moisture is expected to increase only in parts of the country. So one thing we see that is even where moisture might increase, even where precipitation might increase, soils could be drier in the summer. And now I will hand it off to Dr. Daniel Wright, who will be talking about changes in runoff and flooding. Okay, thanks, Steph. Yeah, I'm uh, Daniel Wright. I'm an associate professor at uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I'll kick things off here uh, by covering uh, projections in runoff. And if you're not familiar with what that term means, it's really the, the water that makes its way into rivers and lakes and streams uh, over or under the land surface. And so it is in many ways the end result of a lot of the things that we've seen in previous slides, certainly precipitation, but also evapotranspiration and, and snowpack and snowmelt and, and other factors as well. 
And so what we see here is um, a projected, uh, if you look at least on the average, a projected increase in runoff across most of the country, let's say modest increase. Um, however, you will note um, decreases uh, in, in runoff projected, uh, particularly in alpine regions where a lot of the precipitation is falling and then stored as snow. And as Justin covered earlier, you know, there are projected uh, important changes in, in the amount and uh, properties of snow that have implications for runoff and particularly leading to uh, reductions. And you'll note uh, as well um, uh, in, uh, in uh, the southern uh, part of Alaska, where you have a lot of alpine glaciers, as well as in uh, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, we're also seeing quite strong uh, decreases in runoff being projected. Not shown here uh, it would uh, are the uh, Caribbean Islands, um, and their uh, precipitation is actually projected to decrease, leading to uh, decreased runoff as well. It has important implications for water availability uh, for um, uh, for both human and environmental uses. And I do uh, want to highlight here um, that there is considerable uncertainty amongst uh, different projections. Um, and that uncertainty is really being inherited primarily from uncertainty in precipitation projections that we saw uh, earlier. Um, in addition to uh, being important for water availability. Runoff is a, an indicator of drought and flood conditions. And so I'm going to transition now into uh, the flooding side of things. So if you could switch slides, Liz. All right. So this is stepping through the um, cause and effect of how climate change could, in principle, influence flooding. Um, and I'm presenting it in this way rather than as a map of uh, past or projected changes, because there is a fair amount of scientific uncertainty around um, how this linkage uh, between climate change and flooding has and will play out in different places. And so, you know, kicking things off are increases in atmospheric temperatures, which can then change a variety of things that um, we're calling here flood drivers. So uh, the chapter two climate trends uh, says that there's very, uh, high confidence in uh, the linkage between climate change and increases in short duration extreme rainfall. But then also, on the other hand, um, uh, climate change, as we've seen, is expected to contribute to drier soils and, and uh, more pronounced drought conditions, at least in certain locations, as well as earlier snow melt and decreased snowpack. And so how those factors or drivers fit together um, to determine how floods have and will change in different places uh, it can end up being quite complicated. So certain certain areas we can expect to see uh, increases in flooding associated with climate change. Uh, urban areas are among those uh, where you don't have a lot of soils that can soak up uh, that heavy rainfall. Small watersheds also fit into that uh, category as well. And then there's also an increased um, potential for rare high impact events as well. And then on the other hand, uh, depending on when and where you're looking, drier soils are going to be able to soak up more uh, of that heavy rainfall, uh, potentially uh, reducing flood magnitudes. And then the decoupling of snow melt uh, in the springtime from uh, summertime extreme rainstorms can also decrease the likelihood and, and severity of flooding, at least in certain locations. And so the, the bottom here uh, the arrow uh, just um, highlights the, you know, where uh, we stand uh, on on different uh, um, levels of scientific understanding and confidence about these things. So next slide, please. Okay, so despite some of the ambiguity there in the science around flooding and climate change, um, there is work that's been done uh, um, uh, to, to, to show that it, these impacts are indeed happening. And so this is a figure adapted from a study uh, led by Frances Davenport, who was a technical contributor to this chapter. And so what she was showing here was um, between uh, 1988 and um, uh, 2021, um, there uh, were about $230 billion in flood-related damages. Uh, this is inland flooding only, not coastal. Uh, $230 billion in flood-related damages across the United States. And 
they were able uh, in their analysis to attribute somewhere between 46 and 105 billion of those uh, two changes in extreme precipitation over that time period. Next slide, please. Okay, so continuing on the topic of flood impacts, um, this is uh, showing that, um, yeah, those impacts are, are projected to continue into the future. So this is a, a figure adapted from a study that was showing projected increases in what's known as average annual loss. And so that's basically the average amount of uh, loss that's expected from floods uh, in an average year um, between now and uh, and 2050. And so the national average increase uh, in these average annual losses was about 26%. But one of the other things that this study highlighted was that where those losses um, are expected to take place or who they're expected to, uh, to affect um, is important as well. And so here we're looking at, um, if you focus on census tracts with less than 1% uh, black uh, population uh, versus uh, census tracts with more than 20% Black population, you see an almost twofold increase um, or twofold difference in the um, increased, uh, the projection, projected increase in average annual loss. In other words, uh, that Black populations would be bearing a high percentage, higher percentage of these um, increased losses uh, compared with other populations. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so uh, we had a, a call out box um, that was attempting to tie together some of these uh, findings and concepts, and that was focusing on Hurricane Harvey in 2017. So as I'm sure we're all aware, this is a very high impact event, uh, uh, roughly $150 billion in damages and more than 100 fatalities. Now, scientists have used what are known as event attribution techniques to show that the rainfall uh, that actually occurred uh, from Hurricane Harvey was about 15 to 20 percent heavier than it would have been in the absence of climate change. And that that rainfall furthermore um, increased the flooded area in and around Houston by about 14 percent um, over what, have, what would have occurred without warming and with 32% more homes being flooded. And then Harvey exposed uh, many of the challenges that, uh, that we face around flood management. And, and in particular, I wanna highlight that um, many uh, of the houses who were flooded uh, were outside of FEMA's designated 100 year floodplains. And because of that, they didn't carry flood insurance. And these properties that fit into that category of being outside of that floodplain and thus uninsured uh, were disproportionately owned or occupied by Blacks, Hispanics, people with disabilities, or those receiving uh, subsidized housing. And so this emphasizes these disparate impacts that, that floods um, have and, and will likely continue to have on different populations. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, hand it over now to Debbie. All right, thank you very much, Dan. So I'm Debbie Lee. I'm director of NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. <clears throat> and while these events, such as floods and droughts, are primarily related to water quantity, impacts related to water quality are increasing as well. So climate change threatens the quality of freshwater supplies, and then in turn, ecosystems. As shown in this figure, which is figure 4.2 in the report, Changes in climate exposure, such as ambient temperature, sea level, and rainfall, can create climate-related hazards, such as changes in water temperature, saltwater intrusion, and rainfall intensity. And these can have negative impacts on water quality, such as harmful algal blooms, groundwater salinity, combined sewer overflows, and contaminant transport. So saltwater intrusion is an imminent threat to coastal and island communities dependent on groundwater for drinking water. And agricultural areas face risks to water supplies when fertilizers and pesticides are mobilized by flooding, discharging fertilizers to streams and lakes, feeding harmful algal blooms. And higher temperatures are also putting many areas at risk of exposure to increases in fecal coliform bacteria. 
and treatment plants are challenged by sediments and debris from wildfires in their source waters. So compounded by poor source water, drinking water infrastructure is also aging and deteriorating, increasing the risks of contamination and delivery of unpotable water, impacting the disadvantaged and underserved proportionately. Next slide, please. So while progress toward adaptation has been uneven, examples exist where water resources policymaking and planning are taking into account uncertainty from natural variability, climate change, adaptation constraints, and competing needs. One such effort has been to implement a new management plan to resolve water conflicts within the transboundary Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River system while restoring ecosystems and accounting for climate change. Competing regions include Lake Ontario, the upper St. Lawrence River, which stretches from the lake to the Moses Saunders Dam, which controls the outflow of the lake, and the lower river below the dam to trois Rivière. So competing interests include coastal flooding, erosion, shore protection, commercial navigation, hydropower, recreational boating, municipal and industrial water intakes, and ecological performance. Following more than 16 years of scientific study, including collaboratively built physical, environmental, and economic models, a plan was developed to restore the health and diversity of coastal wetlands and protect against extreme high and low water levels. As part of the plan, an adaptive management committee evaluates the plan's ongoing performance under climate change and recommends adjustments. So the collaborative framework used to develop the plan serves as a successful approach to resolving water resources conflicts. And now I'll turn it back over to Heather, who will talk to you more about infrastructure. Hey, yeah, so yeah, hey everyone, Heather Tanana Yunushe. I am a visiting professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. And I wanna focus just a little bit more on the statement Debbie made about water infrastructure, drinking water systems, sanitation systems that are aging and deteriorating in the United States and have a severe impact on our public health, really encourage people to check out chapter 15, human health. There's also these new focus features and we have one on COVID-19 and climate change. And our chapter and these other areas really highlight how our water infrastructure is not climate resilient, not well suited to handle the climate impacts. And as we're experiencing increased changes in the water cycle, the water quality and quantity impacts are further being exacerbated in part because of aging infrastructure. So who is being the most affected? Again, it's our under-resourced frontline communities. So we're really excited to have this figure in our chapter. Um, really, I believe the first time that this data has been publicly available to illustrate this challenge. So this is based off of data that is maintained by the Indian Health Service. That's a federal agency that's responsible for providing healthcare services um, to American Indians, Alaska Natives in the United States. And given the intrinsic connection between water and health, they've started a sanitation facilities construction program. And this data comes from their home inventory tracking system. So you can see uh, Native American homes that have been uh, identified by the Indian Health Service with different deficiency levels, ranging from a deficiency level of two all the way up to five. And a level two would be something like there is a water supply sanitation system in place, but it just needs some routine maintenance um, or upgrades. Um, nonetheless, it's meeting the applicable regulations and legal requirements of those systems. And then we get up to a level five, and that's when there's absolutely no water supply, no sanitation system in at all. And so uh, certainly I think this image reflects the disproportionate impacts um, that certain communities are experiencing, but also goes beyond our key message two to touch a little bit on our key message three and the limitations of data. You'll notice um, Hawaii is not included on here, Pacific Islands, uh, the Caribbean, because IHS doesn't collect data for those communities. It's not part of its um, agency mission charge. And so nonetheless, um, even though there are limitations in data, data gaps. Um, the available studies we do have show that those communities as well experience um, aging, limited, uh, insufficient infrastructure. So with that, I will kick it back to Liz to talk more on groundwater. Thanks. 
Thanks, Heather. Um, our groundwater expert, uh, Laura Condon, couldn't make it today, so I'll cover that topic for her. Um, like many of the components of the water cycle described in our chapter, groundwater is acutely affected by human activities. Both groundwater withdrawals and recharge depend on human factors and climate drivers. Groundwater is being depleted and is expected to be further depleted as higher temperatures drive increases in pumping. Compounding the impacts is that the hydrologic connections between surface and groundwater make surface water systems vulnerable to declining groundwater levels. An example is the San Pedro River, where pumping that began in the 1940s has lowered the groundwater level to the extent that wetlands and wildlife habitat are deprived of fresh water. The future of the nation's groundwater resources is very much in our control. Uncertainty from natural variability has always been part of water resources planning, but as climate change affects different components of the water cycle, uncertainties around extreme events and water availability have increased. Responses to these growing uncertainties include a wide range of climate adaptation and hazard mitigation efforts, including international and regional cooperation, like the efforts that Debbie described, and several other approaches that we list in the chapter. There are also barriers to adaptation, including the nation's aging infrastructure described by Debbie and Heather, and outdated code standards and regulations. One of the barriers to adaptation is simply the natural fluctuations in wet periods and dry periods wherein the urgency to act waxes and wanes with current or recent conditions. Climate projections indicate this pattern will continue. Challenging planning and policy formulation for adaptation to climate change and suggesting that durable and realistic long-term perspectives are necessary for robust policy development. The good news is that there has been a lot of progress in the data and tools that can be used to understand current and future changes in water resources for adaptation planning. Though much of the water sector continues to rely on past hydrologic data rather than projected information for infrastructure planning and design. This is especially true for planning for extreme events that until recently were beyond the climate model's capacity to project at useful scales. The NCA5 Atlas is a brand new tool just launched, which provides county level projections of multiple extreme precipitation metrics. This tool fills an important information gap for planners, especially in rural and lower income areas that don't have the resources to do this kind of analysis themselves. We encourage you to explore all the information that the Atlas provides. I think there might be a link in the chat to the Atlas. And here are two more fantastic art pieces in our chapter. Um, and you can browse all the NCA art in art by in the art by client climate tab. And you, there should be a link in the chat for that too. And this is the brilliant author team, chapter team, that I was fortunate enough to work with over the past couple of years. In addition to the authors you're meeting today and listed here, we have two technical contributors who helped us with figures, a review editor to ensure that we were responsive to peer and public review, multiple USGCRP coordinators, and last but not least, our federal coordinating lead author, Ariane Pinson. We hope that you find the chapter relevant to your needs and that you explore the regional chapters for water resources information tailored to your location. And thank you so much for attending our webinar. We'll open it up for questions. <laughs>